Hi, welcome to part two of chapter 15, Individual Health Insurance Coverages. We're continuing here with the essential health benefits. So in private health care insurance, if you know the plan is associated with the um, Affordable Care Act and is going to be placed in the health insurance market, it must provide a package of what we'll call essential health benefits. So this is going to be, uh, the idea is to make a comprehensive uh, solution so the customers have um, a choice between different insurers, but all the insurers are going to cover these same essential health benefits, making the plans somewhat, you know, easier to understand what the coverage is going to include. Because for a lot of people, there's so many plans, they're, they're very difficult to research everything the plan offers. So knowing that each plan has to meet a minimum of essential health benefits is beneficial for the insurance buyer. Okay, so let's just cover the, some of the essentials include ambulatory patient services. Now these are services that you that you can get without being in the hospital. So these are you know additional services that uh, this could be like blood work, a CT scan, uh, some diagnostics. Um, so the, the plan would lay out specifically what that would be, food, a colonoscopy, a mammogram. So these are things that you don't need a hospital stay for. Um, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance abuse, um, prescription drugs, rehabilita um, rehabilitation services uh, and devices. So these are just some of the basic um, <clears throat> it also includes laboratory services, that would be like blood work, um, prevention and wellness services for chronic and chronic disease management, pediatric services, uh, oral and vision care. Okay, so that is the basics of what each plan <coughs> is request. Excuse me, is requested to offer. Now, the uh, you can have a choice of different benefit categories. So. And remember, as the categories go from bronze to gold to platinum, they become more expensive. So if you're talking about a bronze plan, this is going to be more of the bare bones essential coverage. Um, so 60, think of it as a percentage of how much the plan is going to cost for benefits. So for every dollar you, you pay, and uh, every dollar that you use in your benefit plan, 60% will be covered by the bronze plan. Um, so typically, uh, your out-of-pocket payments, deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, and other sharing provisions. Um, you know, keep in mind, these cost-sharing provisions usually don't uh, apply to preventative services. <clears throat> and uh, out of the pocket payments are limited to you know the current health savings account, which we'll get into that later. But the bronze plan, think of it, is really only going to cover six percent of the costs. So as you move up to a silver plan, now this is will cover seventy percent of the benefit costs. Um, now the health savings account, this is something that you can set up with your employer. Uh, usually where you can put money in tax-free to be used be, to be spent on health care. So the limit they have for say an individual currently is 6650 for individual for um, for family and be close to the 13,000. Those numbers change every year though. Uh, of course you get into the gold and, and platinum plans, that's going to be 80 and 90 percent typically of coverages of benefits uh, and that, but you're going to pay more for the higher percentage of coverage costs. So the, I guess the idea is if you're relatively young and you're not going to use a lot of health services, maybe the bronze plan makes the most sense for your particular uh, age and wellness. And as you get older, you probably would want to pay more for the more platinum oriented plans that will you know typically cover more of your expenses so if you uh, if you're older with a chronic illness or frequent health trouble uh, the platinum plan would make more sense you would save more money even though you're paying more of a premium your overall annual total expenses will be lower because 90 percent of the, the the benefits would be covered the cost of your health care would be covered now 
the a couple of things to talk about. Uh, of course, the out of pocket limits. This is what I, I we just talked about this as far as um, in the previous video. There is a limit to how much money they could set on the insurance plan. They can set a, a limit of how much money you pay out of pocket annually. Um, so say say it says the plan says you know there's a limit of two thousand dollars that you that you uh, will pay in the form of deductibles or coinsurance or home payments for the year. And once you reach that two thousand dollars, once you pay the two thousand dollars, you don't have to pay any more for any any of these coinsurance or copayments or deductibles. Um, which is a good benefit as well. And that kind of rolls into the last plan, astrophic plans or coverage. So this is a particular plan that <clears throat> the idea here is you don't want to pay a lot for health insurance. And you feel that you're relatively ha uh, healthy and you have enough money to cover the basic needs of your health care. However, you want to protect against um, a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic uh, event. So you, you get some sort of illness or injury that's going to cost thousands of dollars of care for the year. So this catastrophic plan is what would, you know, help cover um, the costs. So as far as, you know, the plan is going to, you know, average less than 60% of total average care costs, um, you know, and these are typically plans that people under 30 would take, you know, so the idea is if you get a, you know, because the deductibles of, are substantially higher, the um, it would only really benefit if there was, you know, some sort of um, health tragedy that could wipe out your savings. And, you know, there's some things that can happen to you that could cost a million dollars in uh, health care costs. So this these catastrophic plans would, you know, cover you in that event. But as far as daily... Um, or weekly or monthly uh, healthcare costs are really not that they're the worst of the plans as far as routine coverage and routine medical conditions. You'll pay the most under this plan, but it will protect you from a devastating, expensive hospital or, or medical care in an event of a catastrophic health event. We're not going to review all of the potential benefits you'll get from a healthcare plan because they're so numerous and cover so many potential. <clears throat> <clears throat> healthcare costs that what we are going to talk about is a couple big ones that you should be aware of. So inpatient hospital benefits, this is a big one. This is going to cover if you have a hospital stay, your room and board charges, um, different types of intensive care treatments, uh, equipment, nursing care, and other services. So inpatient hospital benefits can be very expensive. So your, your plan should have coverage of that outpatient benefits and this is going to be when you get out of the, the hospital for surgery or some kind of uh, care in the hospital the outpatient is a continuation of this care at a separate facility that's going to um, hopefully administer cures or maintenance beyond what the hospital can offer uh, now uh, physician benefits uh, this would be covering uh, all, uh, Visits to your physician, cons consultation, specialist, surgeon fee, anesthesia fee, chiropractors, physician ass assistants, nurse practitioners, uh, physical therapists, and such. Uh, a pretty common, most, most commonly used benefit of a medical plan would be this physician benefit. Uh, preventive services, so this would be sort of like your physical, this could be uh, screenings, um, you know, uh, colonoscopy, mono um, it, it could also be for, you know, just uh, inoculations, vaccines, flu shots, things of that nature. And then, of course, outpatient prescription drugs. So these are uh, drug coverage, which is, you know, a very important benefit because a lot of Americans would probably spend the most on their drugs. And if you're over age 50, um, you're probably taking anywhere from one to five different prescription medications. So these can be quite expensive. So generally these uh, plans will have a, a co-payment for your, uh, the drugs that are prescribed to you. And this will help uh, cover those costs, which can be substantial for some conditions. And uh, you know, some of these drug prescriptions can be $500 a refill. So this is a very, this prescription drug part is a very important part of plans. Now, Let's talk about 
um, deductibles. So the deductibles work in, on a yearly basis. And so if you have a deductible, it has to be satisfied only once during the calendar year. So for marketplace policies, they're definitely going to contain the calendar based deductible. So what this, this means is that say your deductible is $500. So all the medical expenses you occur in the beginning are, are typically not covered until you reach this $500 uh, calendar year deduction. And then everything else is covered after that. Um, so the reason they do this is help to because for, for many people, they may only have $500 or $1,000 of health care needs for the year. So this is a way of reducing the cost to the insurer of the health plan to have these deductibles. And if you're familiar with car insurance, you know that they have, you know, deductibles. If you get into an accident, the first $500 or $1,000 of the damage you have to cover, then they cover the rest. So it works very similar to that. And this is to help eliminate small claims uh, and help to reduce, you know, some of the administrative costs by not having all these small claims processed in the beginning. But it's typically a way to keep costs down for the insurer. So again, if you want the, the lower this annual calendar year deduction is, and some plans even offer it to zero, the better the plan is and the less it will cost you. So it's an important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at <clears throat> comparing different medical plans. What are the calendar year deductibles? Okay, now let's talk about the coinsurance provision. Now, um, so the coinsurance, this provision is, is another way that insurers are going to try to help, re, you know, reduce premiums by reducing the amount that they have to, the insurers have to pay, pay and prevent you from over, over utilizing the plan. So what, what happens here is there's a percentage that, you know, beyond the deductible, there's going to be a percentage that you're going to be required to pay of the service. So say you meet your deductibles for the year and those are out of the way, and then you get a $20,000 um, medical situation that you have to pay for. They could give you, they might, if your plan assigns a 20% coinsurance, that means that you would have to pay 20% uh, of that bill, no matter what. So even though all your deductibles are met, there could be a coinsurance provision charge. So this again is a way to say that, you know, make the, ins the insured person always pay something. So, and for the insurance company that helps reduce their costs, but also helps to keep you more mindful of how much medical treatment you're going to seek. Um, now, a co you know, again, you have to remember these insurance companies are trying, you have two sides here. You have the government trying to regulate and make these healthcare plans more fair. And that's part of the, the, uh, Affordable Care Act is to try to make the health insurance more fair and more transparent for the insured person. The insurance companies on the other side, they want to make sure that um, the premiums they collect will be more than the payments they have to pay for the coverage. So they come up with these things like co-insurance, co-payments, deductibles, in an effort to ensure their profits. Now, that's just why the Affordable Care Act, uh, well, one part that was good is it limited the amount of pro profits these insurers could make because the insurance companies were really being greedy as they are at one point in history and really just collecting, taking too much of a cut of the health care insurance. And one of the reasons for the, uh, the huge increase in medical care costs. Now, on the other side, you also have the doctors and the hospitals and they want to be compensated for their expertise and their care and their time, you know, so they fit there too. Now, the doctors are, co are constantly trying to work with the insurance companies to make sure that they get their fair share. And so as much as the insurance companies try to uh, limit the benefits to the uh, insurance policy holder, they try to limit the payouts to the doctors as well, because they want to sit in the middle and make as much money as possible. And the um, Affordable Care Act realizes that insurance companies need to be contained somewhat to, to ensure that, you know, individual re recipients of insurance get good health care coverage and doctors get reasonable payments for their services. Now, so the co-payment um, 
is a flat amount that you're going to pay for certain benefits. So it could just say, you know, you could have uh, a co this is most commonly you remember this if you go to a doctor, your your primary care physician, and you have a copay means you pay twenty five dollars for the visit, and the copays could range for a number of different instances. For seeing a your primary care, for seeing a specialist could cost more. For a copayment for a prescription drug, copayment for a hospital emergency room visit. So these are all things that another way that they're trying to get some money out of you. Uh, and also make you think twice before going to your primary care physician five times a month <clears throat> rather than maybe only two times were needed. So, you know, this is a way of putting some of the focus on the expenses to the uh, insured. And this, this helps you to be conscious of what you're spending as well. Now, the idea here is that you should go to the doctor and get all the medical care that you require um, but hopefully you don't get extra medical care that is no benefit to you and it's just going to raise up costs or expenses. And this is where typically um, physicians have to be monitored because sometimes physicians may pump up the bill by doing unnecessary uh, tests or treatments that really won't speed up your recovery or your solution to your problem. They just know the cyst. Some doctors aren't as... Um, honest and they may try to do okay we're going to do this that and the other thing to pump up the bill so they get more money but really you only need one of those three treatments so not all of course not all doctors do this but it's something that insurers have to watch out for and that if you are a patient and you feel your doctor is doing unnecessary things this something should be reported to the insurance company for them to investigate to help keep costs low for everybody okay Let's talk about out of annual out of pocket maximum limits. So, um, a lot of the plans will have a total out of the pocket spending limit, meaning that there's going to be a point where you stop you stop paying anything. The insurance is going to pick up a hundred percent of your eligible expenses. So, this out of the pocket limit is an important thing to focus on when you get health insurance, and this could be set up as you know ten thousand, a hundred thousand. Each plan can be different. But once you read, and this is this is why those catastrophic plans are important to see what is the the, the limited out of pocket annual expense because then the hundred percent of the medical care will be covered by the insurer. Now, some common areas where certain medical uh, procedures will not be included in this out of pocket limit or in coverage, and it's common for cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, not to be covered long-term care such as nursing homes hearing aids and weight loss programs typically fall out of scope of this uh, out-of-pocket limit or sometimes out of scope of any coverage at all um, but insurers have to give information on comparison of plans so you can really compare what are the the features of different plans especially out-of-pocket limits compared to the plan that's being offered so the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, is also going to have some additional advantages uh, in the way that law shaped up the insurance industry. One thing is this comprehensive benefit. So the, the ACA is going to provide, you know, uh, which we talked about before, this broad comprehensive uh, health care benefits that each plan must meet. Uh, now, additionally, there can be options to purchase additional coverage for dental, mental health, uh, um, that can be add-ons as well. Uh, a dramatic reduction in the uninsured rate. So because this realignment of the healthcare plans and the ability to um, you know, offer plans at substantially lower costs, the idea was, and to make eligibility for things like Medicaid more widespread, the, the ACA intended to reduce the amount of uninsured people which they were successful at. Now, why is that important? So you might want to understand why that is important. Um, so uh, the reason is, is that if someone, especially just take a look at hospitals, there, if a lot of people are uninsured and they go to the emergency room, they're likely never to pay the hospital for those services covered, which means the hospital has to uh, cover those costs and that raises the cost to all other patients and all other future patients. 
So it's an extreme benefit to hospitals to have more people covered. Uh, more people with healthcare coverage will, will theoretically take better care of themselves and be, and be less of a strain on the medical system if they do more preventative type of care and work. Um, so this, as well as having a healthier and happier population uh, with better life expectancy results and, and such, and also having, you know, if we have a reduction on insurance rates, especially with um, the insurance rates of the younger children and younger adults, this helps to overall increase the pool of people who are insured, which should reduce the rates for everybody. So if more, the people who are, have insurance, so there's people who need it the most. Uh, people who are elderly or have healthcare problems, they typically are gonna make sure they have healthcare insurance. Um, but many younger individuals, 30 and younger, who don't use healthcare as much, probably can get away with not having health insurance. It's not a good idea, but including all those people uh, in the total pools of everybody that has insurance makes the insurance uh, a lot less expensive for everybody because you can spread those costs over. You know, so the subsidies for a large percentage of um, insured, uh, <clears throat> so this, a you know, the ACA, you know, we wanted they wanted to make millions of uninsured people who lack the basic health care because of high costs they wanted to do something to lower the costs so that like i was explaining more eligibility uh, in programs some government programs like medicaid but also in the types of coverages in the healthcare market and the government facilitated this by offering of course a combination of tax incentives and at one point before it was changed um people who didn't pay for health insurance were actually charged the penalty, but that that was later removed. So now because the what they wanted to also prevent is people having um, bankruptcies due to catastrophic medical costs. So a lot of young people or people without health insurance may go along for a number of years just fine and they have that one incident. It may even be a small incident that's relatively easy to take care of but could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. So, you know, it could be a medical incident where you wind up in the hospital for a week and that could result in a $50,000 bill. Now, if more people have insurance, uh, less people will file these bankruptcies, which are, you know, bankruptcy is going to be a huge cost to the overall economy. So if those can be prevented, that's another benefit of the ACA. Okay. Um, some disadvantages, of course. This, I mean, I don't think any person has read through the whole law. It's a huge law, so it's horribly complex. And although their aim was to streamline administration, it's become an administrative nightmare because it's so complex and so large of a law very difficult to understand. Uh, it has, you know, as we look at higher premiums and deductibles, the, you know, this has occurred. So the financial burden on some individuals and some families have, you know, unintentionally created higher deductibles and um, higher premiums. So the ACA didn't make everything better. Some plans actually got more expensive. Um, no choice of individual uh, health benefits. So, so applicants who, you know, select a certain level of coverage. We talked about these earlier, the bronze, the platinum, um, or catastrophic. This can determine the percentage of the total bill paid. However, the medical plan expense benefits are provided as a package and the choice of individual benefits, uh, is not going to be permitted. So it's sort of it's sort of like it's not a menu where you can just pick and choose the coverage you want. It's sort of like a cable package. You get these channels whether you want them or not. You get this coverage whether you want them or not. So you can't really highly tailor the individual benefits like you would in say a menu. Um, so relatively fewer insurers in the marketplace plans. So the marketplaces that they set up, some areas may only have one or two insurers. So they really didn't weren't successful in creating a, a big economic marketplace that they had they had hope. Uh, <clears throat> and there's been a lot of political uh, 
unpopularity with these plans as far as becoming a bipartisan issue between Republican Democrats, typically Republicans not supporting the Health Care Act and Democrats supporting the Health Care Act. This stems back from when the law was initiated under the presidentship of the Democrats when Obama held the White House. So Republicans were um, upset because this was really railroaded through the Democratic House and Senate and signed by a Democratic president. So naturally, the Republicans are not, they can't take credit for this and are very happy um, with the ACA. So they spent the better part of four years during the Trump administration and Republican administration to try to strike down the ACA, which they were successful in some elements of it, such as the um, individual tax penalties, but majority of it stayed law. And it still rem rem uh, remains a hot political issue that the, a bipartisan issue, which is a shame, really. It would be great if the parties could get together and really make a healthcare system that would work for the population. And that's what we're all, Democrat or Republican, we're all rooting for a better solution to healthcare in America. Now, managed care plans, we're going to talk about this. <clears throat> so, if you're an individual, uh, most of the medical expense plans today are sold as what we call a managed care plan. And this is just a term that we use for, you know, medical expense, expense plans. It's going to provide you medical coverage um, in some sort of cost-effective manner. So the managed care plans is a way that the insurers are going to try to work to reduce uh, the costs of the healthcare coverage. So they don't want to reduce the amount of coverage you have, but they want to work with doctors and hospitals to try to you know, manage the plan in a way to, to put an emphasis on, um, you know, the choice of physicians, uh, you know, and limit, limit, you know, could be limited to you know, different physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare providers that, you know, join a plan network. So sometimes they carve out this plan network, which is going to be a, a, a list of providers that are in what they would call in plan. And typically they have the insurance company will have gr agreements with these providers on what they'll charge and the health care that they'll offer. Now, of course, there are different types of these plans, and there could be a what they call a PPO, which is a preferred provider organization. So this is a, a plan that's going to, you know, contract with, like I was saying before, physicians, hospitals, and they're going to put together a medical, medical coverage service policy uh, with discounted fees if you stay within this network. Um, so the, the so if you have a PPO uh, insurance plan, you can elect you can receive care from any of the physicians, hospitals, or healthcare providers within the plan. However, if you go outside the plan, uh, the coverage is not as good, and you usually pay a substantially you know the coverage the plan will cover some of the expenses, but not as much as you stay in plan. So it's a way of sort of uh, the insurance companies locking in. Uh, deals or agreements on expenses and costs with the providers within their plan. So if you go outside their plan, they don't have these same agreements and um, the insurer will have to pay more, you will have to pay more. Now it does, so the benefit of this is it's going to lower the overall premiums for you if you have the health insurance as a PPO. And most, a lot of plans are PPOs. However, it's going to limit your choice of physician. So oftentimes, you have to you know, use what's available and you may not be able to have access to some of the best doctors if they're not in your PPO. Um, now, the, I had mentioned this before, the health savings account. So this is something that I had mentioned before. And this is um, you know, something that you should be knowledgeable of. If not, you know, for the fact that you may be want to work in the insurance industry, but also just as a person who could use this. So if you're eligible, uh, and that means you, you know, you're under 65, you can establish this account, which we call a health savings account. And this is going to basically, it's sort of like a 401k for healthcare. So what you do is you put in money that's not going to be taxed into an account. And then you could use this account to pay for uh, medical expenses that, of course, have to be qualified through your insurer and also through the government. So, so what this does is lowers your out-of-pocket healthcare costs because you can pay with uh, pre-tax dollars. Uh, so if you have, so 
especially if you have a plan that has high deductibles and you, you're usually going to pay out of pocket, you may pay $2,000 a year for your health care. Uh, and this could be, you know, this is also useful for dental because a lot of, most dental plans will, won't pay more than 50% of the costs for things beyond preventative care. Uh, so this could help if you're in state and federal tax area, you may pay 40% in taxes. So this will make basically a 40% discount if you save the taxes and use that money to pay for your health care. Um, and most, most employers do offer this. Uh, and you contribute, basically contribute in a weekly format. So you set the amount that you want to contribute to your health savings account. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's $5,200 uh, $5, a year or $100 a week you want to put into your uh, HSA. And then during the year, you can use this to pay for your expenses. Um, and the real advantage of this is you're saving the tax dollars. So to put $5,200 into uh, a pre-tax account, that means that your paycheck doesn't go down by $5,000 by $100 a week or $5,200 a year. It may only go down by $60 a week because $40 would normally go to pay for taxes. So that's a benefit right there. Um, so continuing with this uh, HSA, the account holder can withdraw money uh, tax-free for medical costs. And you have to, this is something that you really need to investigate first because you may have to provide receipts. Some costs you think should be covered may not be covered. So you have to be an expert in how this gets deployed. Um, so you're going to receive, the benefit is you save those tax dollars that you normally would pay for on your income. Um, and now this, this makes you a little bit more sensitive to the prices you're paying or the costs that you're going to be spending in healthcare. So, so ideally this may be help prevent you from using some unnecessary services, which helps keep overall insurance costs lower. Um, but if it, for, if it, it, but that could work as a negative. If it prevents you from getting necessary treatments or preventative care to save money, then in the long run, costs will go up. So we don't, they definitely don't want that. They want you to be mindful of what you're spending, but they don't want you to be cut out necessary health care treatments just to save money. That would be detrimental. Okay, so let's move over to, uh, before, let me just go back for a second, because I want to also mention that um, there are limits, and I talked about this earlier, um, there are some limits to, to the amount that can be contributed. And these change on an annual basis, but typically uh, for individuals, it's around uh, 3500 and for family coverage, it's close to $7,000. Um, and if you're over 55, you can add $1,000 to that typically. So there are limits to how much you can put into this HSA. And you also have to be cognizant of there could be, um, you want to know what happens to the money if you don't spend it? Because in some, some cases, it doesn't get rolled over to the next year and it may be lost. So you also want to be cognizant of if I put $2,000 into my HSA, and I don't use some of that. What happens to that money? It's a good question to ask. And for many plans, that money just is lost, not rolled over to the next year. So it's something to be aware of, be mindful of. Okay. Because that tax treatment is great that you get that tax reduction, but if you don't get to utilize all that money, that's a problem. Um, now, uh, before we go into long-term health care, um, I just want to go back to the HSA again for a second and think about um, I think overall, it's a good thing to utilize this because it does help you to keep your overall uh, medical costs down. So I'm going to uh, suggest if you do have an employer that offers this, maybe start out small, like $500 and get used to using it and see if that if you if you use all of it and you could have you could have had it be a larger amount the next year, you can increase it now. You know, because. The, some of the problems with this, if you are a low income individual, you may not have the money to spare to put into this HSA. So, so a lot of people see this as a benefit mostly for wealthier people, which is a criticism. Um, so it works best with higher incomes, of course, who pay more in taxes. And that could be one big consider, um, 
um, criticism of the plan and it's not as helpful for the poor, poorer Americans. Um, so just keep, there's a couple of things I just wanted to mention I know about the HSAs. Okay, let's go finally to the long-term care insurance. So um, we talk about long-term care, we're really talking about uh, nursing homes. Uh, but it's not just nursing home facilities. It could be hospital stays or at-home care. Uh, now, this is a very expensive component of your medical needs. So, you know, if you were going to stay in a nursing home or when, if you're going to put your parents in a nursing home, that could be eight to $10,000 a month. So having a benefit that will pay a daily or monthly benefit towards this type of care um, is a huge benefit. And here, here in the slide, it gets 44% of men and 58% of women over age 65 will need nursing home care sometime during their lifetime. Um, and most insurance policies um, may not cover this. So long-term care insurance policies will be, you know, a beneficial additional policy to have um, for this type of care. And, you know, in the nursing home care is so expensive that it can wipe out a person's savings. So if you had an elderly person that needs to go into long-term care and they have a million dollars in savings, you know, within 10 years that can be wiped out. So if they stay in that long-term, you know, healthcare 10 years, so buying a long-term insurance policy uh, might be some, a very smart thing to do for people who have a lot of money um, because that will protect them from that all going to the nursing home, which could happen. So, you know, it's just a staggering amount of cost to be in a long-term long uh, care facility that insurance only makes sense in this area uh, because it is so expensive to be um, in these type of facilities that it could be devastating to families. And there are some families who just don't have the time or the ability to care for people at home. You know, or the space or the you know, expertise. So, you know, the expense incurred is quite substantial. Now, reimbursement. So some of the common types of policies um, could be reimbursement for the charges in the daily limit. So they can say, we'll give you, you know, um, a daily benefit anywhere from 50 to $350 a day. Uh, and you'll have to pay the rest. Um, Depending on the facility, the, the, the amount that they contribute could be different for a hospital stay than, than nursing care, than hospice care. Uh, but there could be a limit on the total amount spent over the lifetime of the policy, meaning that if someone's going to be in a nursing home for 20 years, the, the, the long-term care insurance may not cover it after the per, first 15 years. Um, so these are things that you have to know in the different types of policies that, you know, could be, you know, one, you know, I guess the expense incurred policies is probably the one of the most common. And this makes it, it's easy for consumers to understand this because they're going to contribute um, per each day of nursing care that's incurred. So the higher amount of contributions, so they can pay $300 a day, um, the more expensive the long-term care plan is going to be. So, you know, at $300 a day, we're talking about $9,000 of coverage a month, which will cover most healthcare nursing home facilities. So this is a protective in case, since the cost of these facilities are continually rising, having this daily limit does also protect them from, you know, you choosing a facility that may cost $500 a day. Um, so of course the cost of the plan is going to change depending on how high your daily limit is. Uh, now, if you look at the, Indemnity policies, um, these are like more of a per diem policy. So it's going to be a flat amount that's going to be paid regardless of the actual health care expenses for the, long, the daily long-term care. So it's not going to be um, paying, you know, so if the, the facility was $200 a day and your per diem was $200 a day, it would pay for that. But if it was $220 a day, you still just get $200. Um, now, you could receive $200 even though the actual expense is only $150. So that's sort of one of the benefits of these types of plans. Um, uh, so some, uh, some uh, life insurance policies may include coverage for certain long-term care expenses, such as a nursing home. So that's something else as a way of getting 
additional coverage that you might have a health and uh, life insurance plan um, that could also include some sort of a, a policy or rider that's going to uh, help pay for long-term care as well. Um, so this would allow you as a policyholder of life insurance to withdraw part of the cash value for long-term care expenses and coverage. Uh, and that's something that, you know, um, may be beneficial in life. Uh, you know, it's sort of a hybrid life insurance policy. It also has a long-term care component to it, which is, a, you know, a pretty good benefit to have, I would say. Now, depending on the policy, long-term insurance care uh, should cover, uh, you would want your policy to cover, you know, these basics. Nursing, the nursing home care, that's a big one. Home health care. So you, you, you may not need to be in a nursing home, but you may need someone to come in and help you cook or clean or uh, dress. Um, respite care for a caregiver. So if you're someone who is taking care of somebody, you can get um, some help in, in, in that department. Uh, hospice care. This is basically people who are close to dying will be in a hospice care situation. These are really the worst off people. Or who are expected to die. Uh, personal care in the home. This would be, you know, um, similar to the home health care, but this would be more personal care in the home. Facilities, assisted living, services and assisted living facilities. So what what is an assisted living facility? It's not a nursing home, but it's a place where you live where there are additional, um, there's some additional level of support or help um, for the people who live in the facility. So they will have people on staff that could be called in to help in per, a certain situation. So it's it's not a nursing home, but it's, it's still some additional assistance to living in this facility. So you're not 100% independent. Uh, you get a little bit of help. Uh, so those are the important things to know about um, how these policies are put you know, together. Now, the... Um, this elimination period. So this is basically a waiting time or period where um, the benefits will not be paid. So this may be, you know, the first, you know, 10, 20, 90 days, you'll have to cover the care. And then after that, the plan kicks in. So they know that most, a lot of times, most of these caregiving situations could be for an accident or for an illness or uh, something that's not going to be chronic where the person may only need 10, 20, 30 days of care. So in order to keep costs, insurance costs low, they may require you to pay for the first 30 or 60 days of care. And the longer that this elimination period is, the cheaper the insurance will be to purchase. So this could, you know, it does limit your expenses if someone's going to need um, the rest of their life to be in a nursing home. Uh, you know, so you know, it's a trade-off. Do you want to have a longer elimination period? Then you'll have the insurance will be cheaper. If you have a shorter elimination period, the insurance will be, of course, more expensive. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit more about eligibility and benefits. So let's look, what is a benefit trigger? Uh, now, these you know, policies are going to have these benefit triggers, which are going to determine... Um, if someone's, you know, chronically ill and, you know, are they eligible for the benefits? So the insured has to meet one of the triggers to receive the benefit. So they have to basically qualify to receive the benefit. You can't just say, I'm putting my mom in a nursing home and expect to get paid. They're going to have to have, um, a certain amount of what they call ADLs or activities of daily living you know, which are, you know, could be dressing yourself, bathing, cooking, um, being, you know, moving from a chair to a bed, using the toilet. Uh, these are different things that would be considered an ADL. So benefits are paid if the insurer cannot, you know, perform a certain number of these or a combination of these ADLs listed in the policy. That would trigger the availability of the insurance. So another trigger would, uh, would be need for supervision to protect against threats for health or cognitive impairment. You know, for example, if there's a short or long-term memory impairment, this could be, make it difficult for somebody to live alone. So this could trigger, you know, if this commonly dementia or Alzheimer's, this will trigger um, the benefit as well. 
So non-tax qualified policies have you know more uh, liberal eligibility requirements and make benefits available um, if a medical necessity trigger is met. So we have these um, what you would call tax qualified plans and non-tax qualified plans. So this is just a, a, um, a stipulation. Um, and basically means that if, you know, that benefits can be paid if the physician certifies that long-term care is needed and if the insured does not meet any of the, um, does not meet any of the benefit triggers described. Um, so non-qualified policies may have a different list of ADLs that the insurer has to meet. So basically, um, you want to work with your doctor, and if your your, your doctor is the one who's going to really certify if they're meeting these uh, activities of daily living. So it's not something you judge. It's something that's going to be uh, your doctor is going to be asked about. But there also may be a review of the patient uh, to see if they're they're qualified. So the insurer could come and do an independent review as well of what the person is capable of. Review the medical. Uh, diagnostics, the physician's recommendations, and also evaluate the person directly. Um, because you can, you can see that the insured companies want to make sure that the benefits are going to people who truly need them, not people who think they need them. And by doing this, they can help lower the insurance, the cost to insurers, and that will hopefully lower the, the cost of the plans to the insured. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, long-term health, uh, long-term care insurance. Um, now, you may, inflation is a big part of this because, you know, you may get these plans 20, 30 years before you need them. And the cost of today will be dramatically different 10 or 20 years from now. So if your plan has some inflation protection, that's going to be really good. Um, you want policies that are guaranteed renewable. So you don't want them to cancel it when you're most likely to use it. So you want them to be sold, you know, and generally the policies are you know, currently sold as guaranteed renewable. So they, you know, they can't be canceled. But on the other side, rates can, in, can increase uh, and can increase to the point where you can't afford it. So that's one way unofficially they get you to cancel it, uh, which is really a uh, despicable thing to do if you're paying into this long-term care for 10 years and then they cancel they, they effectively make outprice you from being able to pay for it when you need it most. Um, terrible way to run a business. But some exclusions um, can be included, such as these are things that won't be covered. Um, mental or nervous disorders, alcoholism, drug addiction, illness caused to act of war like PTSD, um, treatments that should be paid by the government, attempts at suicide or self-injury. These are things that these long-term care companies will not uh, compensate for uh, or, or provide benefits for. Now, if we look at non-forfeiture uh, benefits, uh, so most insurance are going to offer these non-forfeiture benefits, which is an optional benefit that's going to provide um, benefits in case the policy lapses. So, so basically an example of a return of premium, a benefit or a shortened uh, benefit period, uh, if there's a lapse in the policy. Now, so the most common benefit would be a return of premium or a shortened, like I was saying, a shortening of the benefit period. So. Under return of premium benefit, the policyholder is going to receive cash as a percentage of the total premiums paid after the policy lapses or the death or death occurs. So under the shortened benefit, coverage continues, but the benefit period or maximum dollar amount is reduced. Um, so that can help. So, so if the insurer does not, you know, you know, purchase these optional non-forfeiture benefits, uh, some states require that policies include a provision called the contingent non uh, forfeiture benefit uh, upon the lapse of coverage, uh, which is going to give you as a policyholder the option of premium uh, premiums raised by you know, some sort of percentage um, to the policy date. So for example, if a policy, if you're insured at age eight, um, 65 
and the premium will rise 40% above the original premium, the insured has coverage decreased by daily benefits or, or converting the paid up policy to a shortened duration of benefits. This means that you can modify the policy if needed to be, uh, if certain situations change. Um, they, they do have um, a partnership program. So some states, and this again is the, you know, this is involved with um, Medicaid and different states um, have, each state has their own Medicaid policies. So, but many of the states will have this long-term care partnership program, which will reduce the Medicaid expenses or um, by eliminating or reducing incentives for some people to rely on Medicaid to pay for long-term care. So Medicaid is, you know, this is something that's a combination of states and federal, a welfare program that pays for coverage of applicants who are, you know, usually very low income. So, um, so you can combine this with regular insurance to help pay for this coverage. That's, you know, especially coverage is not eligible for Medi Medicaid. Um, so this is a way of trying to combine your long-term care with what Medicaid does offer. Um, and this will, you know, the, the idea is to encourage people to, pr to purchase the private insurance policies and not uh, rely on Medicaid. Now, the, see, the problem with Medicaid is that they will take all of the person's assets uh, and the spend down requirement for Medicaid if someone's put in long-term care. So that means if if your, your grandmother has a million dollars in the bank and owns a house and she goes to go and she's on Medicaid and goes into a nursing facility, Medicaid will take her savings and her house to help pay for the expenses. So if you have your own private insurance, this will help protect your assets, which is, you know, there's other ways of doing it, but that's one way. Um, now, your disability income insurance and what they most insurers will say is that and the statistics prove this out. You're more likely to be disabled than to die before age 75. So if you are disabled, so say you're somebody who gets a medical degree and you start working at 30, you have $200,000 worth of debt, student loans, and you start making you know $200,000 a year as a medical professional, you may, you should get this you know disability income insurance that's going to provide... Um, uh, income in case you're disabled for long term. So this basically will ensure that you have, you know, uh, I once knew uh, a friend who, who, uh, who was a dentist who had a car accident that had an effect on his brain function, not an effect that was very dramatic. He could still live his life. He could still do most everything, but he wasn't going to continue practicing dentistry because if he was to come into a malpractice suit or uh, this could be brought up and he could be negligible for practicing dental care due to um, this injury of his brain that you know, on the surface really uh, maybe only impaired his function by 5%. But it's enough that he would have to become disabled. He couldn't really be working in his profession. Um, and if you can't find replacement income, then this disability uh, income would come up. So oftentimes, if you, you you become disabled in the way that you can't work, this, these plans will kick in to provide coverage of some or all of your pay of what when you were working. So you do have probably a 30% of, of suffering some dis disability that keeps you out of work for more than 90 days during your lifetime. So if you, you know, this is a good way of guaranteeing your coverage of your income, and especially if you're someone who's living month to month and you don't, you can't afford to be out of work for one month or especially three months, this is a great insurance plan to have to protect you against a loss of income due to a disability. Now, the most common definition is a total disability. So this means that you can't work at all. Um, so you would have to, of course, there's going to be, um, all these stipulations to see if you qualify and, you know, what's your ability to perform, what you, you know, the duties of your occupation, um, and we can look at material, substantial duties of your occupation. So there's going to be a checklist to see, you know, um, 
based on your training and your experience, uh, you know, can you, you know, do your current job or can you get gainful employment in some other job? So it's sort of a loss of income test. Now, a partial disability is going to be someone who is, like it says, partially disabled. So that means you can perform some, but not all of your duties, your occupation. And this might be time-based, means that you're able to work 20 hours a week, but not 40 hours a week uh, due to your medical treatments or your, your physical endurance. Uh, so you can get reduced pay or, or you can get you know partial coverage of your lost pay due to a partial disability. You know, uh, so this is something that is another additional benefit to have. Uh, residual disability. So a lot of policies will, you know, can include this residual disability benefit rather than the partial. Uh, so this can be added for additional benefits. So the definition of this um, residual disability, the different insurers are going to have a different way of what this, how to write this out and what this is going to mean. Um, but basically it means that you are gainfully employed, but and not totally dis disabled. So solely because of a sickness or injury, your loss of income is at least 50% of your prior income. So this means that you don't have to, you know, this could be a, a different percentage of, of the benefit paid to you based on the reduction of your income due to injury. So it's not a, you know, a partial, which would be 50%. It could be um, a different percentage of payout based on loss of income. So it's sort of, it's very similar to a partial disability, but it's just like a residual disability where you can only work at 80% capacity. So if we look at the, you know, the benefit period, um, this can be length of time that the benefits are going to be payable uh, after our elimination period. So the elimination period is basically, again, another waiting period where you can't collect on your disability uh, insurance for, say, 30 days or 14 days or 90 days. Um, so many policies may have a waiver of this premium provision. So uh, if the insured, if you're totally disabled for, for 90 days, uh, future premiums will be waived as, you know, as long as you remain disabled. So you don't have to pay for these future premiums. Um, but there is a benefit period, meaning that, just going back to the top of the slide, the benefit period would be that the insurance is only good for 5, 10 uh, 20 years or up to a certain age until you're age 65 because at age 65 the social security uh, can kick in so there are limits to you know how long you can stay on disability although most per, most people's disability are short there are still a number of people that take a long-term disability so this amount of the benefits period is important you know, so looking at your health, so if you get a shorter benefits period, say five years, and then the longer elimination period, say 180 days, the insurance can be relatively cheap. So it's really how you can figure. Um, I would suggest definitely getting 10 years or more of a, of a benefits period and uh, a elimination period of 30 days or less. But that's going to cost you money because it's more likely that they're going to pay out. Uh, now, a waiver premium provision. Uh, so if you're insured and you're totally disabled for 90 days, future premiums will be waived um, as the insurance as you remain disabled, which means you don't have to pay for your disability coverage while you're receiving the disability. Um, the rehabilitation provision, this is going to include, so if your policy includes this, then they're going to agree to help uh, rehabilitate you or give you additional um, educational training to help find additional income or additional um, job you can take on after your rehabilitation period. So if you're able, if you're able to work in the same field, they may be provide benefits where you can continue to work uh, in, you know, hopefully in a different functionality. Okay. So moving on. Um, accidental. Um, death, dismemberment, or loss of sight benefits. So these are things where um, you want the policy to pay uh, in case of there's an accidental dis uh, death, usually at work, a dismemberment, loss of a limb is what that means, arm or leg, loss of sight uh, in an accident, 
So the ma maximum amount per, uh, paid as a principal sum is based would they be based on some sort of schedule. Um, but these are additional things that you would want to have covered. Some other additional benefits you could do would be a cost of living. So this would be able to periodically adjust your disability for, you know, <clears throat> insure, uh, basically inflation. Um, the, you know, the option to pur purchase additional insurance. Um, so in case you need additional disability income benefits, you'll be able to uh, uh, purchase additional benefits uh, in the future with no evidence. Uh, I don't know how to basically say this. Um, this is, well, I guess I, I would say the premium is going to be based significantly on your age and the time of the additional benefits are purchased and also what your condition is. Uh, Social Security rider, something that um, Social Security disability benefits are difficult, very difficult to qualify for Social Security disability benefits. Um, the very strict, um, but the Social Security rider pays you additional amount if you turn down uh, if you're turned down for Social Security disability benefits is what it means. Um, return a premium uh, if the uh, polysorder claims experience is favorable. So uh, this this particular add-on, uh, you'll get part or all of your premium back if the claim, if the policy claim experience is favorable. So for all our types of riders, for example, one rider refunds part of the premium for uh, specific intervals, any loss of claims paid, the refund typically ranges from six, 50 to 80 percent of the premiums paid minus any claims over a 10 year uh, possible, you know, possible situation. Uh, OK. Again, another guaranteed renewable policy means that they can't um, discontinue the policy. It's going to be guaranteed renewal on the annual date. Um, and you can, premiums are going to increase. You can hopefully get a policy where premium, the increase in premiums are limited. Uh, you can have a policy that's non cancelable, so they can't cancel the policy, or refuse to renew as long as the pe uh, premiums are paid on time, is another way of saying it. Um, and that's a nice thing to have, because you don't want them canceling it, especially when you're most likely to need it. Uh, there could be a conditional renewal policy, meaning that the the policy holder can renew up until a specific age, usually 65. So the condition can be at 65, you can't renew. Uh, some policies can say they are non-renewable; they expire at a certain period of time. It could be a policy only good for 20 years. Um, Now let's move over to this Uniform Individual Accident and Sickness Policy Provision Act. Um, you know, and this is a provision for all individual health insurance policies. So one, the entire contract consists <coughs> of the policy application and the riders. Um, to a time limit on certain uh, defenses. So this is a clause in life insurance. If the policy has been paid uh, in force for two years, three years in some states, the insurer cannot void the policy or deny a claim based on misstatements in the application. So it gives it a timeline where the insurance company can investigate and try to look for fraudulent statements. Uh, and that, you know, so that's an important thing that they can't dig back into it 10 years later. Uh, a grace period uh, after, the, after the premium due date is paid that you know uh, if the premium is paid after the due date within the grace period coverage remains in force so if you forget to make a payment and then two weeks later you pay they can't cancel your policy which is a nice thing to have because it would be a shame that if something happens to somebody you're struck in with grief and you forget to pay the insurance and then they try to cancel your policy you know uh reinstatement provision uh will let you reinstate a lapsed policy if the policy lapse uh, goes into effect you can reinstate it uh, notice of claim provision, which means that you have to give written notice to insurance 20 days after the coverage is lost. Claim forms provision, an insurer is required to send uh, the insured a claim within 15 days notice of being received. Proof of, proof of loss provision, the insurer must send a written proof of loss to the insurer within 90 days of the coverage loss occurs. Time of payment 
of claim provided, the insurer must pay all claims immediately after providing a proof of loss. So these, again, other stipulations that you should be aware of in the health insurance uh, provisions. There's also payment of claims. So death benefits, are be, um, death benefits are to be paid to the beneficiaries that must be established. Physical exam and autopsy provisions give the insurer the right to examine the body to make sure the claim is legitimate. A legal action provision requiring um, the insurer to wait at least 60 days before proof of loss is submitted before legal action can be uh, brought up against the insurer. Change beneficiary uh, is not required unless the beneficiary designates it's irrevocable in the change of the beneficiary. So these, again, other stipulate stipulations that can be involved here. So you can see that, you know, uh, individual health care coverage, long-term disability, um, long-term you know coverage in general is a very um, difficult because there's so much involved there's so much legal stipulation so big uh, large amounts of these contracts uh, that are set up so many stipulations and writers and legal terms that it can be overwhelming and you know it often becomes a situation a lot like when you agree to terms and conditions to a website or, or an app on your phone you see these long, long, long paragraphs and paragraphs of conditions and terms, and you just don't read it. You just sign it and hope for the best. Uh, and that would be a mistake. So any health insurance coverage, you, you definitely would want to take the time to really review uh, getting extra help if you need from a lawyer or a specialist in the area uh, to explain what's, what's eligible, what will be covered, what won't be covered, drawbacks and advantages no matter what plan you take under this area a significant amount of work and research and due diligence is required from the individual to make sure you're getting the best plan and care and that you can plan for and approach the insurance companies in a way that you're most likely to get the benefits or, or paid out benefits and coverage so that's why it's important to be knowledgeable and as an insurance agent if you're selling these types of plans or advising uh, on these types of plans, you need to be knowledgeable to answer your clients' questions in all these particular areas and hopefully craft a benefits plan for them that would be the best combination of uh, factors that would be that would be the most advantageous advantageous for your client. Okay, that concludes chapter 15. We're going to move into chapter 16 next week. Employer. Uh, benefits, group life, and health insurance. So we're going to move a little bit more detail into these areas. Thank you for your time and take care.